also a, a partner uh, investigator with the ARC Center of Excellence. Um, they do make mistakes. Um, and I'd like to, uh, you know, try to get started on, on the, the cheery theme that we've all heard about um, how bright things are for coral reefs these days. And we're thinking about new paradigms for ecosystem-based management of coral reefs. And um, I think I start this way. Uh, yeah, and so the, the um, title that I was assigned uh, follows this cheery theme of um, how to kill a coral reef, lessons from the Caribbean. Um, I'm going to um, modify the title just slightly. How to Kill a Coral Reef's Lessons from the Caribbean, uh, and Hope for the Future. <laughs> Always the optimist. Um, and I'm going to take you all back um, 35 years, the way things were. Um, this is me in St. Croix in 1972. <laughs> and things were really different. I had hair. Um, at the time, the United States was involved in an unpopular war. We, we got into that war for just a bogus reason. Um, we, we ended up losing the war. Um, so things are really different back then. And, <laughs> and behind me, we have coral everywhere. And as a student, um, you know, I want to be a good student of nature. And I'm looking and I say, wow, this is terrific. There's coral wherever you look. And uh, this is the way it's always going to be, right? Um, about eight years later, I was working on my PhD, also in St. Croix, working on a perfectly good four reef in St. Croix. And within the next 10 years, uh, looking at the exact same site, I just watched it collapse. Um, those are the same locations. Um, simultaneously, I was working in Jamaica. And I had uh, my shallow four reef in mid-depth site. And 10 years later, uh, that in fact is the same coral colony, we saw a complete phase shift to macroalgae. Well, uh, the science of coral reefs has changed a lot. We've become very good coroners. And uh, what we've learned to do is figure out how the patient died. And, um, and we learned some other things, like the oceanography of, of pathogenic diseases throughout the Caribbean. The, the diadema die-off was an absolutely remarkable phenomenon. I was working. Uh, in the Caribbean at the time, and we had fields of sea urchins. They were just a royal pain in the butt and, um, and elsewhere. And, um, and, and I almost never took any pictures of them. They were just so abundant. And uh, in the morning, they all looked fine with their spines up. And by the afternoon, their spines were down when they hit in St. Croix. It's really amazing. Anyway, that was a, a significant change in terms of, uh, of an herbivore. And... Um, at the, about the same time, but not getting anywhere near the same attention, we had, as Betty showed us, the, uh, the white band disease that came and spread throughout the Caribbean. It was uh, first reported in the 1980s, but the footprint of impact was huge. And those two things actually conspired to fundamentally change the coral reefs uh, in the Caribbean. Many of the reefs just became macroalgal reefs. And and really, what we learned, and, uh, and the kind of stuff I wanted to have in this talk, but Terry told me it was hopelessly complex, is, is really a story that I think we understand pretty well. Um, we thought the reefs were in pretty good shape. Uh, while fishing pressure was taking uh, away v several trophic levels that we know about, but parrotfish were being eroded from a lot of the places through uh, over, uh, overfishing, and diadema populations were swelling and meeting that functional role until they succumbed to disease. So we have the problem of a, of, a, of a trophic cascade that became disrupted, and then a reef that changed suddenly and surprisingly. And a lot of the change, uh, not only the loss of herbivores, but the fact that, that we had such hyperdominance by uh, the acroprid species, uh, that when they died, of course, the, the surface area of the reef increased for algae terrifically. So the average grazing rate de facto declined. And so what we're looking at is a reef that fundamentally changed. It changed in a very surprising way. And a lot of that change was the result of just a handful of species um, becoming extraordinarily rare that were very important in the past. Well, we've heard an awful lot about coral bleaching, but, um, and we've heard a little bit about resilience, but the fact is the 1998 bleaching event uh, 
really arguably could be uh, an experiment uh, in a sense. That is, we had a, a time horizon throughout the region. And, you know, I was working in Palau um, and Belize, and I was able to um, uh, visit the Great Barrier Reef. And the interesting thing isn't uh, the depressing part of how the corals died, but how they really recovered. The last time I had been to Heron Island was 1978, the same time I was working in Jamaica when the reefs there were in good shape. And when I went back in May of 2005, I was impressed. Many of the sites that I had visited looked maybe better than they did in 1978. And that's in stark contrast to most of the places I work in the, in the Caribbean. Belize got hit with the same intensity of bleaching as, uh, as Heron Island, and uh, it is not doing well today. So it really, I don't think it's so much the frequency of, of disturbance that matters, that it, that it does the frequency and the rate of recovery. And... This is getting at this concept that Lawrence talked about in terms of reef resilience. And another good example is Palau. Um, Palau uh, suffered a 80 to 90 percent mortality. It was a, uh, from the 1998 bleaching event. By the time I got there two years later, I was seeing um, a huge number of recruits. Uh, and Rob Van Wasek uh, sent me this photograph seven years later. A lot of the reef is in pretty good shape. And what I noticed that's really different here compared to what I see in the Caribbean is that we're talking about very well-grazed reefs. We're talking about um, very little macroalgae, certainly an abundance of recruits. And one could make the argument that, you know, they're in full recovery now. And so it's not hopeless. So many of the bad news stories we've been hearing about <laughs> sound like you know, I gave this talk one time, and I put together all the information I had about the decline of coral reefs, and I just really worked hard at it, and I gave my best shot, and when I looked up, everybody was staring at their shoes. And we have to worry about the cul-de-sac of despair, and the fact is that we, there are some opportunities out there that I think are worth uh, pursuing. So, and I think that there is some promise in thinking about resilience, and the, and the key aspects here, I think, is identifying the key drivers of ecosystem structure and function, and I think developing a process-level understanding of things like recruitment, herbivory, and predation are useful, not by any means the end-all. So, that although many of the reefs in the, in the Caribbean have become seaweed reefs, not all of them have. Um, this is my study site in Bonaire, one of them. And I've been working throughout the Caribbean in recent years, and just so I, I, you may not know where Bonaire is, it's in the southern Caribbean. And uh, one of the big reasons why I think this has resisted this phase shift is that it has relatively abundant herbivorous fish. I mean, very simple reason. They, they ban spear fishing, they don't use trap fishing, and it's only hook and line, and parrotfish don't go for hooks very much. But they seem to be key drivers to uh, coral reefs, and I think Lawrence was saying the same thing. And as a matter of fact, if you look around the Caribbean, and if you look at using the Atlantic and Gulf Reef Rapid Assessment, where you look at herbivore populations um, and you look at seaweed abundance, um, there's a really nice inverse relationship. It's, a, it's very large scale, and the fact is that you find Bonaire at one end and Jamaica being the Geneva standard of a degraded reef. This, has been, this kind of trend has been shown before. Williams and Palloon showed the same thing. But the big thing here is the so what. These seaweed carpets we know have big effects. They can stress corals. They can reduce feeding. By the way, I have no idea how sound got into this PowerPoint. <laughs> if any of the graduate students can tell me how to turn it off, I'd really appreciate it. It's, so never mind the little whoosh sounds that you hear like that. <laughs> Well, yeah, how to make death of a reef funny. Um, anyway, the reduced reproductive output, and um, it makes corals more disease-prone, and it reduces habitat for baby corals. And if anybody in the back booth can turn the volume down, that would be great. But what I really wanted to get at is the, is the next swoosh, which is, um, uh, w w is that swoosh, and that is making uh, the habitat um, more receptive for baby corals, um, or the, that reduction. And... Uh, in Jamaica, uh, and Terry took this photograph, but anybody could have, and um, uh, the fact is, if you look all over the Caribbean, you look at the, um, the distribution of corals, and you look at algal abundance, and you see uh, some places, like I just showed you, are at one end of the scale, and Jamaica's at the other end of the scale, and 
This probably has something to do with the famous decline of, of coral cover throughout the Caribbean. Since 1977, there's been a dramatic decline, and my point being that when I'm go my surveys in March show, and I've been doing this regularly, you know, Bonaire is really right about the same cover we saw in the 1970s. So, by most definitions, I mean, like Lawrence's definition of, of, um, of resilience, the Bonaire reefs are resilient. They've been able to resist the phase shift of macroalgae. They're in full recovery after Hurricane Lenny hit them in 1999. And, um, and why they're recovering uh, is, is, I think, uh, an important type of research that we should be thinking more about because I think we need to buy ourselves some time while we wait for the politicians and everybody else to reduce emissions. Um, baby corals must keep up with the disturbance, and grazing fish uh, controls uh, the seaweed on reefs, and it makes them, uh, you know, really more receptive for, for baby corals. And uh, I've been looking at this using settlement plates, and uh, I've got settlement plates all over the Caribbean. And the kind of story, this is just a, a quick abstract, is that when we just look at recruitment rates, we see that we're getting something on the order of about three times higher recruitment rates uh, on bone air, and, um, and we can compare that to other places, but a very important point is let's look at the, exactly where corals are recruiting. And if you look at the tops of, of, these, of these plates, almost nothing recruits there. And the sides, it's a, it's a modest amount of recruitment. About 85% is on the underside, really outside of the major areas of grazing and fouling, uh, it's very important that we have this kind of microspatial heterogeneity, but consider the Caribbean that has lost its major branching corals. It's becoming uh, more like a pavement, and so uh, the recruitment potential, the receptivity of the reef is going to drop accordingly. If you look specifically at some of my, my plates, like the ones in the Virgin Islands, um, you look at it and you'll see that uh, algae grows completely around the plate. So it's really not too much of a stretch to say that the seaweed could be blocking the nursery habitats. And when you literally look at the plates that have been down for a full year uh, in, in uh, St. Croix, uh, they're just smooth as a snake's navel. It's, it's, it's clean. Um, it looks like they went down yesterday. There, arguably, uh, there's no floating larvae, no baby corals, because we're dealing with these kind of lethal carpets. Now, uh, in Bonaire, they, they, we see an entirely different story. Um, I would argue that this is a very receptive uh, environment, and what we've been looking at, and I don't have time to give you the details on this, but a succession is being driven towards autotrophs under these very well-grazed uh, habitats. We're getting a suite of coral and algae, including titanoderma, that facilitates coral settlement. Um, this is in stark contrast to the ones that are more hostile for baby corals. There's more macroalgae and microalgae around the plates. We're showing reduced flow rates and reduced flow underneath the plates, showing that larval delivery is reduced. And uh, we're seeing the uh, dominance of heterotrophs, sponges and colonial tunicates, all of which are hostile to settling corals. And so you're seeing a switch in terms of uh, how receptive the reef is to baby corals. And of course, this has other implications because the corals, in fact, for some recruiting species of fish, and, and, and we saw some very good evidence of this uh, earlier in the talk, is of course a, a habitat for a number of species of fish. And ironically, one of the major fish, the stoplight parrot, is, a, is a, a fish that recruits to reefs and it needs complex structure and without coral recruitment, we're not going to get complex structure, and it's going to be a death spiral. In other words, this is probably the last thing a settling coral would see before it dies. So there is a consumer connection, and baby corals live longer on reefs with less seaweed. We've been working on this and juvenile corals, and I, and I pulled all the data out uh, because Terry told me to. And, um, Herbivory reduces the seaweeds and makes it really, I think, uh, a better habitat for both the babies and the adults. And so since corals are habitat for these other species of fish, that this resilience uh, applies to the entire ecosystem. So I would argue that herbivory is a key driver, and I'm glad that Lawrence thought of the things that are being uh, monitored and, and assessed on the Great Barrier Reef, that this is one thing that's important. And I think that that's because herbivory is manageable, and, and seaweed 
is a good indicator, and I work in a lot of places that don't have the kind of monitoring capacity that the Great Barrier Reef has. I'm dealing with in developing countries, and they want relatively simple proxies. And I say, measure the seaweed abundance, and you'll see if you're winning or losing this one. And I think there's some cause for optimism. If you look on, uh, in some of the marine protected areas in the Caribbean, um, this is work that Pete Mumby published, but in the non-park area, you had uh, fewer parrotfish and you had a lot of seaweed. In the area where there's no fishing, you had more large parrotfish and there was much less uh, algae there. And Aronson and Precht have shown that uh, the diadema have begun to come back in a few places in Jamaica. And in fact, in those places, macroalgal abundance is declining, corallines are going up, that always makes me happy. And um, taking the, the wider view, um, you see that, in fact, as diadema was fluctuating, so too were juvenile corals, according to Edmonds and Carpenter. The point being that it doesn't matter if it's an urchin or if it's a parrotfish or other things, it's the process of herbivory that actually seems to have a real positive effect. And you can actually see um, where macroalgal abundances have, in fact, declined significantly now since the mid-1990s. We have patches of significant coral growth, and this is now a photograph taken in Jamaica. Now, granted, this is not the landscape, but there are patches that look like this. And so I would argue that there may be some arguments for hope because this is clearly in the same kind of acidic environment and thermally stressed environment as every place else. So, a couple of conclusions. Uh, the emerging picture seems to su suggest that resilient reefs, uh, that a resilient reef ecosystem result from the positive feedback um, with key, herb key drivers such as the trophic structure, and that includes herbivory and its control of macroalgae as being a, a, a really important thing to, uh, to, to look to in uh, an otherwise uh, largely um, stressed uh, ecosystem in the Caribbean, and that low diversity coral reefs have less functional redundancy and may be uh, much more fragile to change. And um, uh, when you look at virtually every group, uh, we have two good species of acropora and one hybrid. And so when those two species died of disease, uh, we, we, we lost a, a habitat architecture that is virtually irreplaceable. So we can uh, locally manage key drivers to improve the resilience of coral reef ecosystems, and I would argue that we continue doing that as we keep our, our eyes on the very bigger picture. And with that, I thank you all. And um, uh, the uh, convener was not really careful with the speaker about his time. Uh, there might be time for one.